It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every Wednesday or so at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely, rainy downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, comics.aadl.org. This is the show where we talk about making comics, writing comics, drawing comics, uh, also the lifestyle of the people who make in these things and participate in these things, all the stuff that surrounds this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Drozd, cartoonist and teaching artist. With me today is not a comics artist, but somebody who partic participates largely in the world that cartoonists swim in. We've got Rachel Ashley Lovelace on the show. Hey, Rachel. Hello, Jersey. Been, been meaning to have you on for the longest time. I'm so excited to have you here. Oh, I appreciate you making the time for me to come out. Oh, that's very polite of you. I'm so polite. <laughs> and we should say that just you are, uh, how do we, is, is, it, is it safe to say you're a cosplayer? Yeah. I would say that's pretty safe. I, I know that some people have their own opinions over whether to be called a costumer or a cosplayer, but I personally just go, um, I, I cosplay. What, so. Whatever people call it, right? Yeah. This is, this is one of the terrible things about the periphery worlds that we live in is that there's no good nomenclature and it becomes like a few different op options bubble to the top. Like, am I, a, am I a comics illustrator? Am I a comics artist? Am mm -hmm. I a comics storyteller? I'm a cartoonist. Fine, that that works. I don't care. You know, as long as long as you know that generally I'm telling stories with pictures, right? But I I didn't realize that your your neck of the woods had that too. Yeah, costumer. we do. Yeah, I'm a costumer. Yeah, it's it. I've heard people get kind of icky sticky about it, but <laughs> it's never really bothered me. I I do this for fun, so. That's right. This is not your job. No, it is not. What is your job? You are uh, you work in archiving, right? I do. I work in archiving. I just graduated um, from San Diego State University. Congratulations. And thank you. I'm very glad to be done. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I really had a passion to working in museums that developed in my senior year of college. So luckily, I actually met your lovely wife, Anne, and yeah. was able to come out here and um, start working at the University of Michigan Museum of Art. Mm -hmm. And now I've kind of been expanding my my pathway into archiving and getting more involved. So it's been a very great journey and it's I've been learning a lot so far. So you're kind of like Indiana Jones. I was I've been thinking <laughs> about that and I don't ever say it out loud, but But I, you think it. I do feel like I feel like a real like a super nerd because I actually <laughs> like stuff that no one else really cares about <laughs> no i mean my, my, my wife worked in a museum for a long time and she's she has a lot of experience in museums and libraries and like collecting and archiving information and in indiana jones 3 that that first scene with river phoenix where he's like it belongs in a museum every time i think about it i'm like look at her i'm like yeah he's like he's like a superhero version of what you do right <laughs> um well, okay, so but but you do do you do this thing called costuming cosplay mm -hmm. and um I want to front end this because uh, I, I, a lot of the people who listen to the show are cartoonists, and some of them might be at this point going like, "Why are we talking about cosplay on the show? What's this got to do with comics?" It has a lot to do with comics, obviously, because they're they're, they're intersecting cultures. Mm -hmm. um, but also, a, a conversation I've been meaning to have for the longest time is exploring the tensions and weirdness that happen between fan participation and creator creation. Mm -hmm. We talk about that a little bit. Uh, and then we're going to also talk about like this whole like the just like how we talk about comics like the science and, and thought process of doing costuming and, and cosplay too right and some of the dangers of cosplaying as yes. well yes uh but but we should say that for, for people who have not seen your work i wonder if we should run some photos and talk about you've you've appeared in videos you've been you know uh been on the main stage at uh comic conventions yes right so yes. here we're looking at you it, w w which companion are you here uh i'm rose oh. i usually play rose to my boyfriend kevin's 10. that's kind of how we met the tenth doctor <laughs> <Yes>. yeah <laughs> he's very good yes and then here we are in the costume you're wearing today and this is the command officer yes star trek this uniform. is from the new movies and it's made by a company called anovos who actually makes these are the same dresses and they make the same shirts and everything that you'll find in the movies you can actually buy them that's crazy pants yes so you can actually dress them. okay now which wh wh who are you here oh um right there i'm actually astrid um astrid peth from doctor who and this was also a companion that 10 had for an episode it was a christmas special called voyage of the damned Oh, I don't know if I've seen that one. It's a, it's one of my favorite ones. Yeah. And actually, I must correct myself. I think this is how we met because Kevin actually found that tuxedo on eBay, and it was the same tuxedo that David Tennant wore in that episode. And that's kind of how we came together. We're like, well, 
we could always do these costumes together and it ended up working out. So I actually had my friend Tina, uh, who is a great seamstress, she made this dress. So this is before it could sew. Oh, wow. So, okay, so then this one confused me when I was looking at this one. What is this? This Is is this a, like an anime? This what? is, this is um, an anime costume. Um, it's from one of my favorite animes called um, Macross Frontier. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's an old series called Macross, and they've had a lot of kind of like regenerations of it and mm -hmm. just revamping it. And this more recent one's very like, very modern, very pop star, kind of like stars in your eyes, <laughs> you know, space galactic princess. Yes. And she's the, and she's one of the main characters and I've always loved her and she's, uh, she's got pink hair. I mean, who doesn't <laughs> want to dress up? Oh, there's a girl who has pink hair. I, I'm, I gotta say, I'm impressed with whenever I see these photos, you actually inhabit the character pretty well. Like, I can, it's hard for me to tell that it's you sometimes. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it, it's, it's not like clearly like, I mean, here you are as, as Rose again, I take yes, it. Yes, yes. Okay, but, but like when looking at the, the, the Macross character, didn't look the same. You looked different. You, you're actually doing some acting when you're doing these characters, aren't you? And that's why some people don't like going by the term cosplayer, and some people like going by the tomb costumer, because mm. I guess there is some sort of a difference. And I, I guess you can't exactly quote me on this, because, like I said, it's not really my thing to define who's a costumer and who's a cosplayer. Sure. But some people feel like when they put on the costume, and I think Kevin might have talked about this before, about how uh, some people will put on 10 and they will put on a British accent and they will be 10 when they're wearing 10 or they will be Rose when they're wearing Rose or whatever character that they are. Mm -hmm. But I feel like when it comes to taking pictures, I know with Rose it was very interesting because I had to learn how to kind of give myself bigger lips. I had to kind of uh. play with the makeup and the really thick chav kind of like eyeliner and eyelash look. And I, I know with Rose I've gotten enough practice in uh, that I kind of I kind of know what to do, and in a lot of Doctor Who poses, they're like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the, the the hand on the mouth, yeah, the other the hand very like, shocked. Oh dear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm going into space. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but another one that you inhabit really well is uh, Agent Scully, and you posted some Agent Scully photos recently. I don't know I if did. we have any pulled. I, I think w I gave. Okay, Matt's, Matt's going to pull it up while while we talk about it, but. Uh, it was it was like a ringer. It was it was so scary how quickly you like just inhabited that that character. Uh, um, well, we can wait for Matt to pull it up, but oh, there, oh, it, there is. it is. There there it we, is. We've got it now. Yeah, I've kind of got my um, arms crossed, so you can't see. I actually I went to the Goodwill, found a suit at the Goodwill that uh -huh. costed like zero dollars, <laughs> and I got this really hideous shirt from eBay.com. And uh, Kevin, actually, I have the. I left it outside. Anyways, I brought my F F FBI badge. We actually had to zoom in from every graphic that they had on like the horrible quality stream that is Netflix of <laughs> of all the they uploaded all the uh, X Files episodes, so yeah. you can go and watch them. But if you're looking for things like that, they, uh, it's very illegal to do an FBI badge, um. and so they try to make it look different and a lot of de uh, depending on the shot. Mm -hmm. So we actually made our own and Kevin is a whiz when it comes to anything image manipulation. Image manipulation. So we actually put that together and it's the the most accurate that I've seen and uh, I, for years people have told me I look like Agent Scully. I remember when I was a kid and I finally saw who she was. I was like that's not very nice. <laughs> I don't want to look like her. I was very disappointed. I looked like Gillian Anderson. But she was considered like like a, a, a symbol, like a, a like an attractive lady at the time. I guess. I guess her her features were so sharp that it shocked me uh, that people thought that I looked like her. Can, and you, can you do the deadpan? <laughs> there it is. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I call my my evil eye. My mom. My mommy taught me how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. You do a lot of this. You have a wide range of things that you do. And and when Kevin was on, we did an episode. Uh, I think it was episode ninety four where we talked about um, the hero who refuses to fight. Uh, we talked about He Man a lot, and we talked about He Man conventions. And we talked about um, uh, what was the Doctor Who convention? Um, a Gallifrey one. Gallifrey one, mm -hmm. and and how you went through like. 10 costume changes over the course of the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you got a wide range and you, and you you were serious about having a good time with this stuff. Yes, I know. Put it that way. Yeah. 
Uh, and one of the things that I talked about with Kevin when he was on the show is this kind of sense of community that can come out of these fandoms. And this is where I want to start with this. Is talk about uh, there's that documentary that came out recently. The the what is it? Bronies, the extremely unexpected adult fans of My Little Pony. Mm -hmm. And you said so you watched this, and yes. and it kind of echoed things that Kevin had said to me about like how these weird. Um, I don't, maybe I shouldn't say weird, but just these deep friendships can happen. And like when Kevin was sick and he was going to Gallifrey One, like friends made him a costume because he didn't have time, and they made him Candyman. And like he just shows up, and here we go. Here's your here's your Candyman costume. Um, I wonder if you could speak to this. Like, what's your experience with this? Like the the the, the subculture and the kinds of relationships that can blossom out of this. Like you're dating Kevin. That happened out of this whole culture thing, right? There's been some. I, I want to say that when I first got into cosplay, I, I didn't know what I was getting into. And I didn't realize that how how big, small of a world it is. It's yeah. very small where you end up knowing everyone by name. Uh, but at the same time, it's so big that you don't really know anyone on a personal level unless you put in the effort to do it. And I made a lot of friends very fast. And there's a lot of bonuses and a lot of disadvantages to that. Because I feel like all of us come together because we all like like a TV show or a video game, or we like to make costumes. But sometimes what I've learned, and I've unfortunately had to learn this the hard way, is that you don't actually have more in common than just that. And, <laughs> and so that, when you're rooming in a hotel with a bunch of people <laughs> who are not on the same page when it comes to that, it can not go as expected, but... I, as a cartoonist who goes to conventions, I've had similar experiences. Yes. We both make comics. We, of course, we're like long lost brothers and sisters. Exactly. Not exactly. so. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily so, at any rate. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to throw a devil's advocate question at you. And we are friends. Yes. And this is a friendly conversation. Yes. But yes. this is my want as the host of the Comics Great Show is I like to like explore the question from everybody's conceivable angle. And and I watched that Bronies thing, and it was it made me uncomfortable. Boys dressing as ponies, what? <laughs> Grown-ups. I mean, you got Halloween to be your sexy witch and whatever. Why do you have to go around and spend all this money and time dressing up as characters from children's entertainment and prancing around conventions? <laughs> what a trivial waste of time. Oh. Have you ever seen the pony prancing lady? No, what's uh, that? This is like some like exercise that this lady invented. <laughs> yeah. She's not a brony, but I'm pretty sure bronies have channeled her for inspiration. But she prances around like a pony. It's exercise? Yes. Yes, it's her branded exercise. It's <laughs> the, great. The pony prancing pony, lady. Pony, I don't know what it's called, but I, I know she's a pony prancer. So. <laughs> prancer <Pre> exercise. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> oh, and I thought Jazzer size was great, but Prancer size. That's, that's amazing. Anyway, she has nothing to do with the Brony fan. Maybe she does, but uh, anyways, uh yeah, I mean, I think that like what you said, um within our own subculture, there are hierarchies actually. Yeah, yeah you will find hierarchies. Like King of Kong. Yes, like <laughs> King of Kong. So Which there is, are people yeah. like who are you know, people who just like the show, like they like My Little Pony, they connect to it, they see the softness and they see the the gentleness of it and they yearn for it kind of like they yearn for their childhood, I think. It's it's like something, or, or maybe they, I've seen a lot of people where they write about how My Little Pony really gave them hope when they were in a dark place. And mm -hmm. I've heard this coming from uh, He-Man fans, I've heard this coming from She-Ra fans, I've heard this coming from everywhere, but I, I have... More recently, heard it a, lot, a bunch from Bernie's, but then you also have your other people who seem to do have some sort of a more than kind of what we would deem as normal connection to the show. Just like how you have people who are obsessed with anything, mm -hmm. uh, but you you have. Um, maybe the people who really do think that they are ponies or maybe the people that want to dress up like furries which in the cosplay community is like a whole different thing so if you are a furry you're not necessarily a cosplayer uh. to some people and <laughs> It can get kind of. I love messy. how territorial we become as creatures, yes, you know, we do. like over the littlest weird things. Yeah, it's we like, do. like you could have guys who are like, oh, I'm a fan of the Decepticon jets. Like, well, I'm a Thundercracker guy. Well, then you can't be a Skywarp guy, you know? <laughs> uh, you can't sit on my playground. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> Get off the jungle, Jim. I think I think it was Kevin who actually I first heard the term King of Nerd Mountain. Yes, <laughs> he did say that. That was great. I laughed too. Um, it's uh, personally for me, I think that. And Kevin and I were just having this conversation the other day, but I mean, you have your sports fans, you have your your Walmart Wolverines, right? Who mm -hmm. come here and paint their faces and dress up every time that they're going to come and watch a football game because they're di diehard fans. Mm -hmm. Well, the difference between that and the money that you spend on having a ticket and the money that you spend on getting ready and the money that you spend on buying all the food and the everything and the, the space that you need to park and that all totals up to about the same amount that you end up spending for a convention. So hobbies are hobbies, in my opinion. Whether you're collecting hobby trains, <laughs> which I got a ton of experience with that too, or you're cosplaying. Uh, yes, but that's what Will Wheaton calls sports ball. And oh, that okay. is, that's more serious. Sports ball. <laughs> Uh, but yes, no, that that's an excellent point, right? It, it is it is a hobby. But okay, here's the second devil's advocate question. Then I then I swear I'm gonna back off of this thing. Is like okay, um, SPX is this weekend, the Small Press Expo, and one of the things that I hear some creators, not not SPX themselves, but some creators say like, oh, what I love about SPX is there's little to no cosplay there. Mm. It's all just about readers and creators, mm. and there's none of these people dressed as Edward Scissorhands who are interfering <laughs> with the pure transaction between fan and creator. I mm -hmm. make a thing, you buy the thing. Because uh, here's another thing, I'll go back to your, your sports ball analogy, is those guys are paying tickets, that money's going to the players, right? Some, the players are benefiting directly from the guy who paints his a body half yellow and half blue and goes, woo! Uh, whereas, at a convention, the Edward Scissorhands guy, he's not there to support me, he's there to walk around and get his picture taken as Edward Scissorhands. Mm. So, what would you say to that creator who has that kind of beef with cosplay? I would say that that's not entirely true because I feel like a lot of the people who are going in cosplay, at least I know this is for myself, I love Artist Alley. If there's a convention that I'm going to, I tend to go to predominantly cosplay-centered conventions. That's true. Galfrey One is not that. about me as yeah, a cartoonist. It's, it's about Doctor Who. about Doctor Who. So really, anything goes. You have mm -hmm. your voice actors, like, or you have your actors or actresses that have been paid to come there. But like everyone who's going there is going there to celebrate Doctor Who. I tend to go to those conventions more because that's more of what I'm about. But um, I don't personally see the, the argument as much, I guess, coming from my own perspective because when I see something that I want, and it's at a convention, and I have the money to afford it. I will buy it. You know, um, even dresses Tila. Even <laughs> even dresses Tila. You no, know, I'll. I've PowerCon, the best convention yes. ever. Yes. Which unfortunately will not to, be going through this year. It would have been last week, right? It would have. Yeah, actually, it would yeah. have been last week. It was really. Oh, we were looking so much forward to that. We are the biggest. Masters of the Universe and Princess of Power Friends. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to apologize for that in this room, for crying out loud. But but yes, I would have loved to have been there, too. I was disappointed that it didn't happen. Yeah. But, but anyway, but at PowerCon. Yeah, PowerCon. Um, I was going up to all the vendors, and I was like, I I like your art. I like, you know, I bought a Tila, a vintage Tila figurine. I tried to buy whatever mm. figure I am that year. and Well, I mean, the other part of that art. $200 Crystal Swift wins. <laughs> 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 Worth every penny. Mint in box. Mint in box Crystal Swiftman. Oh, my gosh. But yeah. I wouldn't say that we don't give back to who's in there. It just depends on who you are. Now, if you're a 15-year-old, 13-year-old kid who's dressed as Homestuck and you're running around because this is your first time at a convention, well, I don't think those kids really have the ability to buy anything, let alone, you know, well, I think, I think part of that argument comes out of the notion that they are somehow taking up space that would have been occupied by somebody else. Interesting. Right? Like the Homestuck kid is there. That could have been a paying customer. And they supplanted the paying customers. If it's a zero-sum game in terms of audiences at conventions. Or that, oh, these Homestucks are chasing away the real paying customers. Like the paying customers are there. They got their money. And they're like, mm. oh, I want to go buy some cars. Ah, oh, Homestucks, no. And they go home, right? Yeah. So I, I, that's what I detect in that, and, and that mm. may be, that may be just, I don't know, I, I may be misinterpreting that, but um, I personally don't see the harm in people celebrating a thing that they love, uh, providing that it's not hurting anybody else. It's not like, I'm a, I'm a big Saw cosplayer, let's pretend that the Saw right now for real, you know? Yeah! yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, Jigsaw! Like, <laughs>
it's uh, I you, you're right. Like a Homestuck, you got to wonder what was what would be the potential for a transaction if they weren't yeah. dressed as Homestuck. Yeah, I. I, and, you know, I think that the argument that, oh, someone else could have been in your spot really only applies to certain conventions like San Diego Comic-Con. And honestly, if you had a, sick, a ticket to San Diego Comic-Con, mm -hmm. you deserve that ticket. You know, sometimes if you're talking about like a show like Gallifrey One, which which sells out in an hour now. Holy moly. Yeah, wow. because it's gotten so popular. And San Diego Comic-Con. If you get a ticket to that, you know, what, what, what? in the Declaration of Independence states that you are not allowed to like have a ticket because you are not, you know, we're all supposed to be equal. I mean, you could apply this argument to anything, but I don't really see the whole point in, you know, whining over the fact that, well, I wasn't able to get a ticket. Like most of the time you can get your friends in. I mean, come on, we've all done the, the badge swap, you know, <laughs> or you can buy for your buddies, but like, I. Most cons don't sell out of tickets. I mean, most cons are still running. You can buy tickets the day of. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm, you're talking about the very specified conventions, and maybe I, I don't know, and you'll have to pardon me because I'm not as familiar with um, SPX, but I have been to almost every big convention on the California coastline and some in Chicago, and now we're going to the one in New York when I'm be at New York Comic Con. Are you really? I want yeah, to be there too. Sweet. Yeah, we're going to both be there. So. Oh, very cool. Very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, but I do see, I guess I can understand the whole, well, if someone is kind of perturbed or put off by the fact that there are cosplayers and they don't really want to be there if there are going to be cosplayers, that I think in a sense, you're just missing out for yourself if you're going to really let that bother you. Cause I mean, I, I know some cosplayers that I don't necessarily like, like to be around, but mm. I won't let them ruin my time. Like yeah. I will still go and enjoy myself. And I think that should be everyone's rule. Oh, I think that's a lovely, a lovely way to put it. Okay, one last devil's advocate thing that I want to throw out because I'm just, I'm, again, I'm advocating for the person who's listening to this going like, cosplay, what? Yeah. Um, every year, San Diego Comic-Con happens, mm -hmm. yes. and then there's a couple of uh, TV good-looking people with microphones who go, people lined up at Comic-Con, and we talked to some of the people at Comic-Con, right? Action mm -hmm. 3 is on your side to talk about what's happening at Comic-Con, and they always go up to the guy who really thinks he's the Joker, you know? Yes. And he's like, hi, I'm the Joker. You know, and, and then, like, it cuts to the people in the control, and they're like... Dark Knight Rises Joker, or, like... Well, whichever, okay, right? It'll just be, like, it'll be, like, somebody who's, like, inhabiting the role because they're like, I'm going to be on TV, right? And yeah. understandably so. They're going to be on TV, and they're like, well, am I just going to stand there and be like, hi, I like to dress as the Joker. My name is Fred, and I'm, we're, I'm a CPA, you know? Or are they going to go, like, ah, my, this is my, my chance to, like, inhabit the role on, t on television? And it cuts back to the news people, and they're like, boy, that's a weird freak show event. Who wants to go to that, right, Liz? Then she chuckles, right? Yeah. And so cartoonists might say, oh, my God, the coverage on these things. And it is, the, it is on the news of course, to do oh, a good yeah. job of reporting. But because they focus on the spectacle, because that's what's good TV, they're, they're misrepresenting this thing and saying there's all this literature inside of Comic-Con that people could be getting, but instead they're focusing on the cosplayers. You guys are distracting what could be, you know, you're, you're distracting the media from focusing on what really counts, and that's me, the author. Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, you know, I don't think anyone ever looked at comics and they were like, oh, Ray Bradbury. <laughs> I mean, sorry, comic artists. I, I think that, <laughs> I think, hasn't it been the classic scenario that if you read comic books, you were a nerd? Until very recently, Until yes. Until very recently. So yes. we developed these hierarchies because of that. Because we think, well, because they're making movie, movie versions of Captain America and they're big screen, big budget films, yeah. that means I, the creator, <laughs> you know, I am. I have reached reached my pinnacle. I am God. You know, <laughs> uh, but I mean, you look at people like, I mean, Stanley, who basically sits on his throne of Marvel. Yes. Uh, loves cosplayers yeah. and is always involved in cosplay events. In fact, he started the convention Kamikaze, mm. and that is almost that's a huge cosplay event for like being a startup kind of newer con in Los Angeles and. Uh, he loves it. I, 
I've never encountered a creator who really shunned me away because I was cosplaying. Right, right. I, well, and, I mean, I travel in a lot of different circles, and some of those circles are not the uh, commercial comic book world, mm -hmm. right? Or, or I should say the diamond direct market distribution world of comics, gotcha. right? Um, some of them are very indie, and, mm -hmm. you know, like... and, and I think a lot of times people, when they are trying to build something new, like maybe a new scene, a new indie kind of comic yeah. or whatever, they think that in order to create a revolution, they have to tear something down. Mm -hmm. got to tear down what's old to build a new thing, when actually, it, I think it's about building something new in addition to what currently exists. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, as a cartoonist, if I saw a person come up dressed as Jared the Bonneville Snowman or as Boulder from Boulder and Fleet, I would be delighted. I would be so happy to see it. But uh, and, and, and we, when we talked with Kevin when he was on the show, it's like what he did with the Puppet Benders show. Mm -hmm. He made his own show about Avatar The Last Airbender uh, ostensibly to promote the show because he was excited about it. Mm -hmm. And the creators, to their credit, instead of saying like, hey, Copa, <laughs> shut this down. We own Avatar. You do not. You do not get to make content about this thing. Instead, they roped him in. They said, this is great. We should make this part of the official, you know, media package of Avatar Last Airbender. So I'm curious, like, so what do you think? I'm a creator. Cosplayer walks up in front of me, dressed as one of my characters, and I go, hmm. What's my, what's my proper response? I'm, I'm evaluating how to respond to this. Like, what, what, like as, as a cosplayer, what do you hope will happen if you dress as somebody else's character. What's well, the interaction you're hoping for there? I think that what you're always hoping for, especially if you put a dec any decent amount of work into your costume, that you're going to impress that person because not to be like, you know, I mean, I guess for some people, they their dream, some people's dream is literally to be like Elsa. Like they want to be known as the Elsa, like the best Elsa who ever lived, the real life Elsa. And I guess, you know, for some people, when they would meet, the creator of whatever they're dressing up as, they would want, you know, Bruce Tim to be like, oh my gosh, you are Poison Ivy. <laughs> For me, that's not really the case. I would just <laughs> like them to enjoy yeah. what I'm doing and, the, and, and, and understand that like I'm doing this like, hey, I like what you do. You're awesome, you know? Um, I've had friends who have dressed up as the characters from Bravest Warriors and they met the creators and they they went absolutely nuts and this yeah. is when the it had just kind of started coming out and and they loved it and so for some people all that they want is to put a smile on their face and really let them know that hey i like this enough that i made a costume for it because you're awesome i did uh an episode of the lean into art cast with my friend rob stenzinger and one of the things we talked about on there uh was this this theory that I have, and I don't think it's a very wild theory, is that what humans really want is a meaningful interaction with mm -hmm. other humans, especially with humans who affected their lives in some positive way. Oh, yeah. Right? So, and I told stories about, like, the first time I met Peter Cullen, the guy who played Optimus Prime, and I was really torqued up and nervous, and I blew it. And I just said something stupid, and I walked away, and I was like, why do I feel bad about the way that went down? Uh, and then years later, I had time to think about it. I was like, you know, it's because I didn't interact with him in a way where I felt like he understood mm. what his work meant to me and then I could pay that forward and make him and affect him in some positive way and then I went back and I met him again and I did I interacted in, in a better way and you know, I had this wonderful thing that I'll remember for the rest of my life this interaction with this man and uh, I think when you're interacting with a media of any kind, whether you're dressing as a Star Trek character or dressing as a human character, you are participating in it because it had some kind of positive effect on you. And when you encounter the creator of that thing, you want that to be a meaningful interaction and not just, hey, look, tell me I'm great. You know, mm -hmm. it's more like, hey, your thing made a difference to me. Like if you were dressed as Tila, hmm. and let's say you ran into Lou Scheimer, rest his soul. Yeah. I know, right? You, yeah. You, you would want, you, you, it's not to go like, hey, look, Lou, I'm dressed as Tila. Give me a high five. It's because <laughs> you're saying like, look, your thing means so much to me. I want to participate in it. I want to live yeah. in it for a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I would definitely say that for me, that's the school of thought that I'm coming from. Um, when I first went to PowerCon my first year, I saw many of the people who worked on the show and was on a whole panel of people who worked on princess of power and everything she ra and i was they were all enthralled and i was just happy that they were happy and i even at the most recent last year's power con is when i met uh the two original people from the power tour that were going around yeah. this year, who are now married yeah that's very awesome. very cute and they were 
absolutely great. And she she was actually was the body model for Tila. They actually uh, she actually gave me one of her photos that. <laughs> I the, didn't see this. No, I have it at home. You'll have to. You'll have to wait. But oh. you can see it. I'll pull it up for you so you can see. Okay. And uh, <laughs> she was like, "You got everything right, and you didn't even know like what to make it out of." And I mean, she was just so happy, and I was just like I said, I was just happy that she was happy, and that's all that I ever want. I don't want to offend people. I don't want to, you know, like want to be known for being you know rachel the cosplaying you know <laughs> wizard dress you know and that's personally why i make certain costume choices like yeah. i used to do a little bit you know more racy costumes but now that i've gotten older i don't really feel the same about that and can, we, have... can we go there just for a second yeah. the dangers oh, yeah. of cosplay yes. and then we, i want to, to yes. actually walk through some of the stuff that you've made okay. and because i'm curious what cartoonists can learn from cosplayers about character design and fashion design because okay. there, there was some stories about that recently with Batgirl and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, so, you know, uh, I've been to conventions where a 13-year-old girl dressed as Slave Leia from Return of the Jedi, and I know in her mind this is an innocent thing. She likes the movie, she likes the character, she likes the costume, and she likes going around and she's like, wow, people are paying attention to me because that's what you want when you're 13. Boy yeah, or of girl. Of course. Of course. And then I see a guy my age walking around following her with a camera. And I go, oh, this is not good. This is making me very uncomfortable. Um, sometimes cosplaying can be a dicey proposition, right? Especially if you're young and inexperienced. I don't want to paint this as just pure, like, family fun, you know, with a couple of weirdos. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think that is where I stand very different from a lot of cosplayers because I've had my own experiences. Nothing horrible. But, but but on the, on the periphery of feeling weird and uncomfortable. Yes, I have. And and I don't really agree with the whole notion of well, it is cosplay and it's fun, so do whatever you want. And, you know, they have cons a uh, very popular convention is Dragon Con. That's mm -hmm. well, the, the basically like the mecca of cosplay. And I personally don't go to Dragon Con. Um I don't commend I don't I don't I don't shun people who do, mm -hmm. but it's not really what Oh, it wasn't. It would not be a place where I would feel very comfortable, um, because there is a lot of that. There's a lot of you know, do whatever you want, like, kind of of a feel, a little Sodom and Gomorrah y, <laughs> uh, which is cool if that's what you like. But um, <laughs> I I personally believe that when more people are running around like that and doing whatever they want, there is a higher percentage of something to not great to happen, and um. Uh, I myself, uh, even when I was wearing Tila, I had a very interesting experience where, uh, yeah, well, you know, middle-aged man started coming up to me and persistently would not leave me alone. Yeah. And he was very excited because someone was dressed as Tila and people don't usually dress as Tila, which I can understand. I mean, that was probably, you know, one of his idols when he was a kid. But he kept trying to talk to me. He was following me when, unfortunately, Kevin was not there. And he would not leave me alone. He was always within, like, breathing distance. Mm -hmm. When I thought he was gone, he was still there. Mm. And Tila is a pretty covered costume if you're going to go by, like, you know, I would say, like, sexy, you know, costume mm -hmm. standards. Yeah. So I was not trying to be rude to this man but i also wanted him to go away because i was starting to feel uncomfortable yeah. and luckily that was when i went up to the couple that were the original like i said the original people from the power tour so he man and shira were sitting at their booth and i was talking to them and uh the wife noticed she said that guy's been behind you for a very long time and i said yes he won't stop following me. And she said, why don't you sit here? So I got to sit between he and she -Ra. Oh, my God. <laughs> and they're giving me, they have their, they have the one thing they kept from the power tour were their swords. Wow. They got to keep them. And they when, the, when they put them together, they clang. <laughs> they're really great. And they were just like, here, play with this. Uh, and I mean, this couple's amazing. They have a daughter who... Unfortunately, I believe something she had some type of like a brain aneurysm or a, a oh no something horrible happened when she was uh, young and they've 
looked after her and taken such good care of her and they helped her publish her first book oh, wow. really sweet little girl and she was there and i was talking to her so i had the opportunity to speak to her and she was great and i was really starting to feel comfortable but i realized that the guy was not gone and he was approaching closer and closer and uh, shira i'm just i'm giving them those names because i don't i don't want to like you know embarrass them if they, sure, sure. Wanna, like, I, I know their real names but i'm just trying to give them some you know, well, uh, plus, don't break the fantasy for me. Exactly. <laughs> so, it was Shira who was, was helping Shira. you. It was Shira. She starts whispering to her husband. She's like, I'm not comfortable with this. You need to do something. So He-Man gets up from the table, puts his arm around the guy, says a few words, and comes back. The guy turns around and leaves. And I asked him, I was, and he's like, you're not going to have to worry about him anymore. And I'm like, well, what did you say? He said, I just simply put it to him that her boyfriend's a jealous guy, and he wouldn't really like mm. some guy hanging... And so in the end, he, did the, he didn't do the jerk thing where it's like, hey, buddy, you got to get out of here. Mm -hmm. He did the He-Man thing where yeah. he was the good guy and, said, and, and made a good excuse for this guy to feel comfortable enough not to be too embarrassed to leave. Yeah. And he never followed me around after that. So well, He-Man and Shira saved the day. And, and unfortunately, sometimes misogynistic guys like that, they need to hear the boyfriend thing because they clearly yeah. don't have enough respect for women to back the heck off on their own accord when they see that the woman's uncomfortable. Yeah. Right? Um, but so He-Man saved you. Yes. <laughs> yes. I was very, uh, they were such great people. And but I, I th this, this underlines something that's kind of troublesome yes. about this whole thing. And so if you do have young people in your life who want to do this kind of thing, mm -hmm. it'd be a good idea to chaperone. I think that chaperoning, and I think that there's a there's a couple of things. If you wouldn't mind me going over some Please. some Rachel tips from from Please his do. experience, um, there for a lot of conventions, a lot of people feel like it's easier. Like, oh, let's be at the hotel, so all of our costumes will be there, and we can just all room together and save lots of money. This is not something you want to do with a bunch of people you don't know. Yeah, you need to know who you're going to be staying with, and you all need to be of the like mind or at least on the same page of what your nightly activities are going to be or like mm -hmm. what your schedule is kind of looking like because you're not going to want to just run off and do whatever you want. And that kind of thing does not lead to a happy convention. So my personal advice would be that if you're going to stay at a hotel, don't just go because you really want to stay at the hotel. And I know a lot of people do it. And a lot of people might be like, Rachel, you're being a stick in the mud. But <laughs> I, Quit being a grown-up, man. You can wag your finger. I, I will wag my finger at you as much <laughs> as I want because I'm really strong about this because I have had bad experiences <laughs> because I did not pay attention to the obvious signs that were in front of me like, this is a bad idea. Yeah. This, you're going to have a bad con. You know, <laughs> don't do this. So you have to be safe. I mean, it. yes, it's a convention. Yes, you're there to have fun. Yes, you can dress up like, like it's Halloween and you can be Batwoman or you Catwoman or whatever you want to do, but you, it's still real life. There's still creepy people there who know that you're stuck in your dream world and they would love to take advantage of it, whether that means by they could steal your money, they could steal your costume, or they could put your hands on you, you know? Yeah. And I mean, this is all real, and I caution parents against you know, letting their kids go into conventions without them because I see, like you said, lots of 13-year-olds. And yeah. as we know, that's what happened at Comic-Con most recently. Yeah. And unfortunately for this, unfortunately and unfortunately for this girl, she's okay, mm -hmm. but she sustained some pretty serious injuries. And this maybe could have been avoided if she would have been chaperoned by her parents mm -hmm. or I, I had a buddy system or something. I mean, there's lots of different ways of doing this, mm -hmm. you know, but you have to be careful. It's like the same thing of going to a club. You know, you have, you can't just accept a drink from anybody at the <laughs> club because there are repercussions that come with this. Well, the same thing happens if you go to a convention and you're in a room party and someone hands you a drink, you wouldn't just, you know, Oh my gosh, I didn't even think of that. There's a lot of that that goes on. Yeah, there's a tons of parties. And that's why I said kind of like Dragon Con's a little Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. Because there's, if you're not dressed in a costume, you're, or if you are dressed in a costume, excuse me, if you're not on the floor, you're at a party. Wow. So if you're the kind of person who can handle themselves well and you know how to handle that environment, then go for it. But if you're not, you should really be careful. But yeah, if, if, if you're under the age of 18, 
right? Uh, yeah. Some kind of some kind of chaperone situation probably should be in place. Exactly. And if you're not there with your boyfriend or girlfriend, you should always have a buddy system. Always. Yep. I don't care how old you are. Yeah. It's important. No, you're right. You're right. Very important. Because yeah, yeah, uh, it, it, they they can. It's 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 unfortunate that we have to say this, but yeah. it, it, like you said, it's it real is. life, and these are dangerous places at times. And I did not have this opinion originally when I started cosplaying, and that's why some of my costume choices were a little bit more, you know sexy mm -hmm. and i still like to do sexy costumes but with you know not to the level that i used to because i learned well that is going to attract attention that you don't necessarily want online and offline you know oh, what I mean? that's unfortunate well because i mean like, you should you should live in a world where you can feel pretty and dress pretty right that that's yeah. the, i mean i mean not that sexy and pretty are the same thing yes of course but but uh oh that uh, I, I have nothing, as a white man, I have nothing to say except, ugh, when I hear that women have to feel that way because of creepy guys. I'm looking at you, creepy guy. And it's not just creepy guys. Sometimes it's mean women, too. Who oh, that's true. Don't feel very secure about themselves. And like I said, I'm not speaking entirely from experience on that. I, I am lucky and I have not had that many confrontations because I would not deem myself a popular cosplayer. I've had some interesting experiences, but I'd rather keep it that way because. I have a life outside of cosplay. My yeah. life, my world is not, cosplay is not the center of my world. Right. It's, it's something that I do for fun. And really the best thing that came out of it is that I met a few key people that I, you know, I'm my boyfriend and yeah. some of my close friends I've met through cosplay. And I've, I'll, I, if it was just that for the rest of my life, I'd be completely satisfied. So oh, that's great. Well, <laughs> okay, well, let's talk about some of the pieces that you brought. And, okay. my, and, and while we talk about them, I'm wondering if we can talk about, uh, uh, what cartoonists can learn from people like you about costume design. So while you first. grab your piece, whichever piece you want to yes. talk about first, um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll preface this very briefly with this notion that um, I think it was Andrew Wheeler, I don't know if I can pull it up. Andrew Wheeler wrote a, a piece on uh, Comics Alliance about costume design and about the Batgirl costume design, mm -hmm. and Spider-Gwen, and one of the things he talks about in here, uh, it's so great, we'll link to it in the show notes, it's at comicsalliance.com. Um, it says, the Spider-Gwen costume does a lot of things with remarkable economy. It plays beautifully the iconic design of the greatest superhero costume ever conceived, Steve Ditko's Spider-Man costume. It strikes a contemporary tone with the hood and the neon chucks, but with sufficient restraint that I don't think it will look dated in years to come. It creates shapes and breaks up space in a way that's going to look powerful on the page, and it immediately evokes character. I haven't even read Spider-Gwen's first Spider-Verse appearance, and I already have a sense of tough, haunted, edgy young woman. I'll eat a pair of neon chucks if that's not who she is. <laughs> and, he, and he has a whole bunch of examples in, in the article about all these different great costume designs and how they evoke the character instantly upon view. And I'm curious, when you're doing your um, picking your characters that you want to do pieces on, if that's part of what you're thinking is like, what is does the design communicate the character immediately or like okay so now what do we got here what is this this is my this is my crown when I did my filmation Tila uh -huh. it's made out of warbler and at, there's a there's a craft foam at the center which is making the detailed kind of edging that you see all along the crown so those are just actually pieces of craft foam that have been glued together and then sandwiched in between two pieces of warbler and warbler is a thermoplastic that can be heated with a heat gun. Mm -hmm. Looks like this when you first get it. It's kind of flexible. Um, and you make kind of a craft foam sandwich. So you take two pieces of warbler mm -hmm. and you put the, the your one of your craft foam design is in the middle. Wow. And then after that, uh, it'll mold to the shape of the foam and seal together and you so can bend it. And so that's how that crown was made, which I know is a very... Uh, quick explanation of it but and then you paint the gold on it yeah i spray painted the gold and that's something that i would uh, like to kind of rework because the paint did not hold as well as i thought it would yeah that's <laughs> me to put it on i wouldn't uh, dare yeah, no. put on tila's crown this is tila's man oh my goodness so but okay cool so uh I mean, like when you're picking between Tila and Glimmer and mm -hmm. She-Ra, like here's your Glimmer piece that you're working on I got now. Some glimmer. Oops. Uh, I'm not good at this. Oh, we could, we could, I could hold it up. Oh, like, there you go. Yeah, so Glimmers. <laughs> you can Hello. kind of fit it on my head, like pretend I'm wearing it. <laughs> there you go, it you're is. almost there. Ah! <laughs> we got it. For Bright Moon. <laughs> For Bright Moon. <laughs> So when you're picking these characters, like, what are you thinking about in terms of, or is it just, is it a visceral thing? It's like, I just love Glimmer. 
You know, she's so awesome. Or is it like, oh, I could do Glimmer, I could do Mermista, or I could do <gasps> Pika Blue. Uh, Pika Blue. <laughs> I really want to do Sweet Bee. Uh, yeah. Along. All those things that you said plus Sweet Bee are like yeah. in the lineup eventually. But, but like what, what, what's the, the decision making factor who you choose first? Because I heard you say something about like, oh, I want to do she but that helmet, you know? Yeah, that's the thing is that I am not, there are two, I believe there's two schools of thought when it comes to costumes. There's the people who will sit down, well, maybe there's three. Uh, there's the people who are just excellent. Like there's this one person, Oh, no, I'm blanking out of her name, on her name. She's very well known, and she's known for her warbler making. I mean, she's fantastic. She can make, I mean, it looks like armor, and she uses this, this warbler stuff, and mm. she's just fantastic, and she can make anything out of it. Mm. And there's the people who just know what they're doing. They've had enough experience, and they just go, 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 so they can make a new costume for every con. So that's something very far away that Rachel is not. Um, but then I believe that when you come down to my level, there's kind of two people. No, there's three. There's another. So there's another. They're the people who buy their costumes entirely because they don't have the skills necessarily to sew or to make armor or they just don't have the time, which I used to be that type of a person. And I still have some costumes like my rose or this one that I'm wearing right here. That we I should, Yeah, we should see the rose and, oh. and the other ones. Yeah, I can try and grab them. But then there's the other people who... Will just produce. They're doing simple stuff, like they're doing spandex costumes that don't have too much detail on them, mm -hmm. or kind of the sexier costumes, or you know, that don't take as much fabric or time or whatever, and they can just pump them out. They just pump them out. So they've got a new, they've got three new costumes every convention, or they just make a new costume every month because they have the time, the money, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you have people like me, <laughs> who sit there and overthink. <laughs> The costume until it's like uh, just this jumbled mess in your mind. And you're like, how am I even going to start this? I can't touch it anymore because if I do, I don't know what to do after that. And it's like, maybe we're all like that. But I feel like I'm, I get so stuck because I'd rather not make the costume at all if I can't make it. 100% accurate. 100% accurate. And I, and I, this is pretty good. It's pretty good. I wish I would have done some things different. I really want to remake Tila. See, that's the thing with me is I'm so anal about it. That it's, like, <laughs> it's not me. It's, I, I, so you, you would, if you were a cartoonist, you'd be the one who redraws chapter one six times yep. to get it absolutely right. Well, yes. <laughs> I guess. And everybody else is going, going, but chapter one is great. Like, this no. looks really good. Yeah, it's for costumes I get. I, I am just, and I'm one of those people who likes to wear, use really thick fabric. I want everything heavy, and I want it to be texturized. I don't want it to be, I'm starting to give in and be like, well, I'm going to have to use lighter fabrics, thinner fabrics. It's okay. They're not going to know that it's not the actual this, you know. Yeah. But in my head, I'm always like, yes, they are. Yes, they are, and it's not going to look good, you know. So we all have our weird little hang-ups when we're doing costumes. And all right, well, I want to see some of the other costumes you got and I want to ask you while we talk about them what it is that attracts you to a particular costume like what the thinking process is but mostly what is making is it something in, in, in uh, about the character themselves or is it something about what they wear uh, can, you can take the seat and just hold it up um, but uh, because it's like that, that article that Andrew Wheeler posted on uh, Comics Alliance it was kind of about how the costume itself evokes the character instantly. So, like, when we look at this, this is one of the Rose costumes, yes? Yeah. Um, everything on the costume. Uh, I also have her shoes off to the side, but uh, this is the Idiot's Lantern dress. It's the one that most girls choose to do when they do Rose. It's really fun. It's the 50s episode, and mm. I love the 50s, so I had to do this one, too, I guess. And the only thing that I, I made on this is the dress, but I have actually made this dress twice. This is the second what? version. Oh, no, because, because the first one wasn't perfect. I hated the first one. <laughs> so this one's all lined very nicely. I'm also one of those cosplayers where I like to make my costumes like it would be clothing. I do not like to make something that doesn't have a lining or it wouldn't be 100% professional. I don't, I don't. A lot of people will skimp on doing like a lining or they'll, they'll just make it look good on the outside and not the inside. Mm. So that's the other reason why I get kind of anal about things is because I want it to be a fully functional garment. Mm -hmm. I don't want it to just be something I throw on and I can only wear once. Mm -hmm. Or if someone really looked at it, it wouldn't look as good. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to be a five-footer. <laughs> a what? A five-footer. It's like, like what you say when... 
my friend just taught me this. It's like when you know you get your car scratched up, and from five feet it looks okay, but when you get real oh. close. Oh, I've never heard yeah, that before. Yeah, so then. five footer. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be like. I just I I don't know. I I I want to be like a a seamstress. <laughs> That's my goal <laughs> one day is to get professional. So, anyways, there's the rose dress and it's hemmed at the bottom and all that nifty jazz wow so it's just it's just like kind of your standards 50 strapless dress and the sh the top is actually the top is actually a um the same one that she wears in the show which is a uk brand mm -hmm. um that i hunted down on ebay that's the thing about doctor who clothes is that you have to really live on ebay until you find what you want mm -hmm. because this stuff is like 10 years old if you're if you're going for the stuff from the era that i like which is the 10th doctor um you have to sit there and wait there until it just shows up in your size yeah you had a pair of shoes that like you said you had yeah. to wait forever to get your hands on yeah that's a that's one that most people yeah so it, it's uh are, are they still in here yeah but so this is this is all stuff that you hunt down on ebay yep it took a very long time wow and and finding your size on top of it so you didn't these are not modified in any way these are not these are exactly how they would look like um they've got little tissue paper from my move in there <laughs> um actually believe it or not i did find a pair of these before yeah they were about i would say like a size nine and a half when, and that's not my size. Mm. So I actually had to stuff them with like a thousand Dr. Scholl pads. <laughs> and I would walk around the con just scuffling. You had to put lifts in them. I did. I had yeah. I had like at least three Dr. Scholl pads. Oh my here. gosh. And so I finally found a pair. on. I was just lucky enough to find two pair. And I found a pair on eBay. And it was eBay UK. That's the other thing is that for the Doctor Who stuff, most of the stuff are UK brands. So you have to go to eBay.UK. Uh, Can't even use regular eBay. So I was able to bid on the shoes and I won them. And then I sold my other pair for like $500. What? Yep. Oh, my gosh. They're worth a lot of money. Oh, my gosh. All right. And then you got like Tila's gauntlets that you built. And this is the same kind of deal as you did with Tila's helmet. Helmets. Yeah, oh, these, no, those are glimmers. These are gauntlets. glimmers, actually. And what I'd like to have them do, because in a perfect world, you could close your gauntlet, but you really can't. On the glimmer model from the Maddie Collector, uh, her gauntlets are closed like that. Mm -hmm. So I actually, I'm so bad at pivoting this, but the trim is supposed to line up and create kind of like the seam line that makes a V shape. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to have to do is that with Warblow, what you can also do is that you can attach a uh, many different things like you can uh put up like clasps or clothes or velcro and so i can velcro this shut so mm -hmm. that when it's on my arm it looks like it's but it actually becomes the impossible yeah, design that it is yes <laughs> <laughs> that's the one thing okay you know what we're talking about things yes <laughs> you're I'm, warming up for this I'm one i'm <laughs> gonna get real with you guys with you costume designers if anyone's <laughs> listening don't do that don't, do don't make bracers that that look you know make them have some type of a lacing or something like so that i don't have to feel sad about myself <laughs> about how the inevitable can't happen that is the one thing because every single character from this masters of the universe and princess of power line has these closed bracers yes and it hurts me so bad jersey well and, and they also have like these weird helmet things those are doable no but they, how does it attach when you look at Glimmer, how is this on her head? I have no idea. Right. But you know what I'm doing with that is I'm going to attach a, um, I've already figured it out. I'm going to attach a headband so that, and I'm going to pivot the headband kind of like at a funny angle okay. so that it's going to go on my head and it's going to stay on my head. And that's the other thing is the other good thing is that when you're working with Warble, if you fit it to your head, uh, if you have a wig on, Mm -hmm. It's gonna kind of tighten, so it, it's not gonna probably fall. So. Gets, oh, yeah, and you are gonna have to wear a wig if you're glimmer. Yes. Many people have asked if I'm going to use my real hair, and I'm like, no. No, you're not gonna dye it no, that color. No, yeah, I just had to grow to my butt. You know? <laughs> oh, I mean, that's true that's, too. That's true too. I unfortunately do not have the hair of the goddesses that are in Princess of Princess Power. Princess of Power, Shira. Uh, okay, well, I'm gonna throw a counter argument to this, okay. is, uh, and this is an interesting thing. This is part of that uh, dynamic that's so interesting between like fans and uh, creators. Is like in in superhero comics right now, there's a lot of focus on making the costumes look like the movies, where we see all the seams, right? Mm -hmm. In Captain America's costume, we got to see all the seams because that looks cool. It makes him look real. And then other cartoonists, and you know, I'm I'm kind of in this camp. Is that it ain't real though, bro? 
It, yeah. it's, it's not real. And so Captain America can have just a line that de de delineates where his mask is and it doesn't look like fabric on his face. Yeah. But then it makes it difficult for the fans to participate as, you know, playing along with it if they have to make these sort of... Because, like, the argument is that cartoonists say is that because it's not real, we should ex uh, celebrate and explore the unreality of it. Mm. But then we got fans going, oh, I'm sad now because I can't have the bracers go all the way around, right? Um, I think that to a certain extent, it should be whatever the creator wants. Like, I'm not going to get mad <laughs> at... I, I, I won't get too mad <laughs> at Lou Schreimer and everyone else who made these. Because it's like, this is what they did. And yeah. it's my job as the cosplayer to come up with a nifty way of, you know, making it either look good. And, and that's the fun part about cosplay, is making it look good, you know, on you as a 3D thing, and at the same time, really paying homage to that 2D that you're trying to portray. So, I mean, I'm complaining, but it's just mostly because I'm, I'm a little dumb and I don't know how to, like, make well, this look any better. You're, you're, you're uh, highlighting the frustrations of a creative challenge. Yeah, that, it is, it is frustrating. I just, the gauntlets, man. <laughs> like, anything but the gauntlets. I've made gauntlets. I have made... I have made five or six of these, Jersey, because so many came out wrong. I even made one where they shut all the way, uh, and I couldn't get my hand in it. it yeah. I actually did get the hand through it, but it was really hard getting it out. Oh, yeah, because then you got, yeah, you get stopped like but that. But I tried. Right? No, I tried. Well, you may have said that you don't represent all cosplayers, but I think that you are a good representative for their... They, they should be proud to have you representing them because that you have a very even-handed and fair way of discussing your craft. Thank and you. And your, the, the tensions that arise out of that uh, subculture and comic subculture and uh we'll have to have you back to, to talk about king of kong because i know you got a lot to say about that and i think that I that, that movie sort of encapsulates the weirdness that happens in a subculture and the way people can get so territorial and when from an outsider's point of view we look in going like why are you guys doing this it's so great and yeah. and it may and it really like you said it kind of puts your own uh you realize like you know what I think that's weird. Wait a minute, am I weird? Yeah, yeah. And you are to other people, and that's just that's how it is. I mean, I don't care what you're doing. I, you Walmart Wolverine people, <laughs> I think you're weird, but I respect you. But please don't make the traffic horrible on Packard. I have not experienced it yet, and I'm scared. It's pretty bad. Like uh, getting from from your place to mine on a game day, oh impossible. No. It can't oh. happen. It just won't. So. Yeah, it's 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 pretty nuts. I'm looking forward to your first experience with it. But you're from Southern California, for crying out loud. Cars are like, there's like six cars to each person there. Yeah, but we don't have a bunch of people coming from the entire state to see one game. That's true. The entire the population of the town doubles on game day. Yeah. It's pretty intense. It's too tiny. <laughs> and you're like, freeways are ridiculous, so. <laughs> okay. I love criticizing Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> Boo, Midwest. Boo. <laughs> All right, well, uh, Rachel, we got to do book recommendations. We're way overdue for it because guess what? You're so interesting that we went over time. I know. That's, that's the penalty for having interesting people on the show. Uh, is there anything that you want to point people at to check out about you today? Like if, if you have any like websites, blogs? Uh, I do. I have a couple. Um, if you go to Facebook, my name on fa – my cosplay Facebook is Love Love Lace. Oh, okay. So I didn't know you had a public one. I do. I have a public cosplay Facebook. I don't always talk about it to my friends because I don't want to, like, subject them to yeah. – and I don't post on there that often. Like I said, like, some people are – career cosplayers and what they do is that they they're on there all the time and that's all that they and they do it every day and i i just can't with everything else in my life i can't sure. keep up with it but when i do i do post and uh i also have an instagram account that is the same thing it's called love love lace mm -hmm. i mean it's just my last name with a love in front of it so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i thought stick to something simple <laughs> yes love love lace on instagram love love lace on facebook and then i think i am same thing on deviantart i have a deviantart i don't use it anymore but if you guys want to go look at really old pictures <laughs> like have fun <laughs> but that's the way to interact with you too like if people if like sometimes you know somebody comes on the show and then i get a, a email from a listener saying that person was so interesting so how do i reach out to this person right mm -hmm. so i try to 
put that at the, the, the tail end of the show so people can have an action item. If, they, if you thought Rachel was a fascinating person and you want to say, hey, high five, Rachel, you say good things, you can follow her on Instagram or on Facebook. No high public. fives, though, because you said high fives aren't kosher earlier. I did? You did. You were like, you don't want like Lou Schreimer to high five you. Oh, I didn't mean that. Well, I, I, I would take a high five right? from Lou Schreimer. <laughs> from the grave. <laughs> Any, I'll take his Obi-Wan Kenobi ghost. Come to my house, Lou Schreimer, and I, I will high five you. I, I, <laughs> but I want a hug. <laughs> so <laughs> for, only from Lou Schreimer, though. Don't everybody hug me at conventions. Uh, so we got it. We're gonna we're gonna switch you out with Anne. All right. And uh, thank you, Rachel, so much for this conversation. This was really fun. Thank you, Jersey. I had lots of fun. Hope we do it again. All right. Okay. So while Rachel and our uh, AADL librarian come in. Uh, or while they switch out to uh, do the book recommendation segment. I want to point out for folks who are interested in this topic, um, Kurt, Curtis Sasso does a website called Two Geeks Talking, tgtmedia.com. And September, the month of September, is all articles on cosplay. So there's something to follow up on for more on this topic. Uh, another thing about design, fashion design, that I think is, uh, you know, I, I follow a lot of stuff on Pinterest and on Tumblr to get ideas and inspiration for different costume designs. And I would actually submit that... Uh, all character design is costume is like costume design. It's not just superheroes. You know, the same kind of rules apply to like putting an outfit on a character. Uh, Amy Kim Kibuishi's Tumblr is awesome. She posts a lot of really great images of costumes, and I wind up favoriting and saving a lot of the images. So that's at felax.tumblr.com. F-E-L-A-X-X.tumblr.com. All right. Hey. Hey. Hey, this this it's uh the the ADL staff member is here for book recommendations and it just happens to be Ann Drozd, who is I'm the husband of. Yes. I will admit <laughs> to that. <laughs> so do, do you uh, you remember to stay tight on the mic, but uh so you you are uh you just started. You just came back to the Ann Arbor District Library and you're a production librarian. Yes, day five on the job. Day five on the job, and, and, and they're already making you come on to my dumb show. It's not a dumb show. I'm very excited to be on it. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, but but what's a production librarian? Like, what, does that, what does that mean? Like, are you working on an assembly line of books? No, we are not assembling books. Oh, but yes. production means making things. Yes, we are so. making things happen. We oh. are providing content, creating content, working with the community, working with other librarians and other staff members to create fantastic, awesome things for the Ann Arbor community. Okay, and in day five of the job, so you're just starting building awesome things, and some of these things are going to be comics things. Yes. Okay, you're taking over for, for Sharon Iverson, as I understand it. Sure. Yes, so you're going to be the comics don now. <laughs> big That's shoes what, to fill. Yes, it is big shoes to fill, but, but so th we're going to call you the, the new comics don of the Ann Arbor area. Tonight. And I will not answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what book recommendations do you have? What things did you pick out for us Let's to discuss? Let's see. So because you were talking about fans and cosplay and all of that sort of thing, we have, and where do we need to hold this up to? <laughs> there we go. Okay, so we've got Vader's Little Princess by Jeffrey Brown. And one thing that's kind of cool about this is Jeffrey Brown has dressed himself as a Jedi. And I keep covering the microphone here. So we've got him as a Jedi here. So this yes. goes with your theme. Okay. So it's <laughs> you don't have to sell it that hard. But I mean, like, it, it, is about, it is about participation in fandom because it's about a creator who did not create Star Wars, making a story no, about Star Wars. No, um, and he actually grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, so local oh. connection. But that. he grew up playing with Star Wars figures and loving the movies like many of us and had the opportunity to create a few Star Wars books. So this is his second one, I believe. He did Darth Vader and Son first, mm -hmm. and then... This one did win an Eisner this year. It was for Best Humor publication. Vader's Little Princess, and what is it about? So I guess it's about Darth Vader and a princess. It is, and it kind of goes against the regular storylines of Star Wars. If you're a stickler for that, you might want to avoid it. But it's non-canonical? <laughs> it's non-canonical, but it's hilarious. And I actually I marked a few pages oh, that, okay. that I wanted to show off that I thought were, were pretty good. So we've got... Darth Vader in the cantina, and I just love Here, I the little, like um, I love that there's little stuff for Star Wars fans to enjoy. I mean, obviously you could just give it to, as a gift to someone who is a father, and they might get some of the humor just based on the father-daughter relationships, but then there's all these little hidden tidbits for Star Wars fans, so we've got KB hiding in the 
the cantina scene. Who is KB? KB is an adorable little alien that hangs out with Move Tech. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's all like father daughter things where like yeah they're in the canteen and Vader's dancing and Le Leia's like oh please they're, stop they're in the ballet they're in the ballet oh. they're at the ballet and Darth Vader is not enjoying it but Admiral Ackbar looks like he is and is this Biggs <laughs> with the mustache and Lando so we've got lots of fun things happening for the Star Wars fan uh, they're kind of like strip comics each one is to a page it's Drawn in a really cute style that yeah. adds to the humor. Um, proportions of characters aren't always spot on, but <laughs> the coloring is very charming too, and it just adds to the charming effect of the book. Yeah, yeah. Jeffrey Brown's stuff typically looks like like uh, kind of like an, out of an eighth grader sketchbook, and I think that's part of the the feel of his work. Like Incredible Change Bots feels that way too. Yeah. So, okay, Vader's Little Princess, which you can find in the Ann Arbor District Library's collection. What else do we got? And then we have You're All Just Jealous of My Jetpack by Tom Gold. And he is a Scottish cartoonist. Oh, I didn't know he was Scottish. He's Scottish, yeah. Oh. And this is another collection of strips. These appeared in The Guardian, mm -hmm. and they're hilarious. Um, there's a lot of literary references. There's library references and jokes. Should I and, pull up one of the ones that you selected? Yes, I did select oh, the one the, the, with the, the pig. The pig. Here, let me get this in the shot. Pigs go into the library to find out what the farmer's been talking about. He doesn't quite understand the words ham, bacon, and sausages, and sadly he finds out what they mean. Yeah, so I can read it for the folks listening in the audio, is that uh, the two pigs, one says, have you noticed that the farmer's been using the words ham, bacon, and sausages a lot lately? Panel two, yeah, what do you think they mean? Pig walks away, I'm gonna find out. And then it shows him arriving at the library. Later, dot, 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 Maurice, I've got some very bad news. And I like the, the fact that, that you don't find out the pig's names until the last panel. That's part yeah. of the joke. That's part of his humor, right? Well, and it's kind of charming, too, the way he draws. Um, he's not using a lot of detail. and um, There's little to no perspective. Um, a lot of his drawings are very reminiscent of like woodblock or wood engraving from the 19th and 20th century. And so it adds to the charm. Also, he's doing a lot of like 19th and 20th century literary references. So here we've got a Great Expectations Pip video game, and <laughs> it's just charming. Yeah, his, his, he has a very deadpan kind of, um, it almost reminds me a little bit of uh, Gory, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, Edward Gory kind of deadpan, but but a little bit sweeter, not as creepy as Edward Gory, right? So this is You're All Just Jealous of My Jetpack by, Comics by Tom Gauld. He also did a bunch of other great books, right? Hunter and Painter. Goliath. Goliath, right? Which you talk about in the show yeah, before. So he does stories in addition to just strip comics, but yeah, but this one is great. Yeah, his stuff is pretty awesome. Uh, my recommendation this time is a web comic, and I know I've talked about it before, but it's it's worth repeating. Uh, Starbunny.net is updating now. It's by my friend Dave Roman. Yes, he is my buddy, but I also just love his work. And Starbunny is the co a comic about a bunny who stands ready to inherit a milkshake factory. And uh, he, his brother does a hostile takeover because, after all, Blue, the main character, Bunny, who's inheriting the, the CEO throne, is lactose intolerant. So how can a lactose intolerant Bunny effectively run a milkshake company? And so he goes off on his own uh, to find his way in the world. And all the bunnies have what are called guiding stars, these little stars that float around them like in the Care Bears. And they have a little face, and they give them advice. And when Blue Bunny – get it, Blue Bunny ice cream. It's very clever. Um, he decides that he's going to go off in his own way against the star's wishes. The star says, well, I guess I'm not your guiding star anymore. And so he leaves. So now it's like totally the hero's journey where he has to find his own guiding star and he's got to find it within. It's really, really fun, cute stuff. And I highly recommend it to anybody who enjoys things that are sweet and fun. Also, I just got this in the mail. This came, uh, my preview copy of Hello Kitty, Hello 40. I mean, this will be a little self-serving, everybody. I know last week, or last episode, I, I had Connor do that ad for the Warren Commission report, which everybody should buy two of. Comes out in uh, less than a week as the time of this recording. But this is another book that I'm involved in. Dave Roman and I uh, did a piece for the 40th anniversary Hello Kitty book. Uh, published. It's an anthology, so there are a lot of other artists and writers involved in this as well. That's true, and I should mention some of the people in here because, like, it's... I don't, I don't expect anybody to buy it for me because there's a lot of awesome... Jean, Jean Yang is in here. Uh, David Horvath of the Ugly Doll uh, toy line. Jennifer and Matthew Holm. Uh, oh, gosh, who else is in here? Carl Kershaw, Debbie Huey, 
Uh, Chris Eliopoulos, for crying out loud. Chris Jeruso, oh my gosh. Well, how did I get into this book? Brian Drewhart, Brian Drewhart of the Amethyst cartoon. Uh, also worked on a bunch of amazing Warner Brothers cartoons. She has a great comic called Harpy G, which everybody should read. It's at harpyg.com, H-A-R-P-Y-G-E-E.com. Uh, so yeah, Jacob Shabbat is in here too. Holy cow. Uh, Art Balthazar. I'm, I'm in good company with this book. So this comes out in October, and uh, it looks really good. Uh, if if uh, that all that wasn't enough to sell you on it, Dave and I did a story where Hello Kitty fights a giant robotic shark, and there's the panel right there. So you should go out and buy it uh, in October. It's a great book. So, yes, uh, are there any events that we want to make any noise about before we close out, Anne? Yes, we do. So there is a current access, and there we go. And on the cover is promoting the Web Comics Lab. The first Web Comics Lab is next Wednesday, September 17th, and that will be from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Mallets Creek Library. And the Web Comics Lab is an event where we do what? This is an invitation to creators and web cartoonists, anybody wanting to start writing a web comic or anyone interested in comics in general and wants to know more about what they can do to create comics. Um, this is going to be an ongoing group that's going to meet regularly. So the first one is September 17th, and then the next meeting will be October 21st. And we will be encouraging you to create content and helping you with resources, providing resources from the library's collection to assist you in creating comics. What do you mean, like books or something? Could be a book if you want it to be, <laughs> but we're looking to promote content that will be web related that's why it's the web comics lab and and i mean also the adl is rolling out a web comics or i mean a comics tool collection in the months to come um pretty soon and uh it's going to be tools to assist you in making comics as well i mean not just like oh here's a here's a book on drawing hands but actual like comics drawing tools that you're going to be able to check out and borrow from the library. Because if you haven't heard yet, the Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor District Library has like music tools that you can check out. Music tools, games, Telescopes. lots of models of anatomy. You can <laughs> yeah, get a life-size human skeleton, which is amazing. Out, you can check out a life-size human skeleton from the library. That's awesome. It is awesome. Uh, you can check out like uh, models of different human organs, right? Dinosaur kits, fossils. Guitar effects, microscopes. Models? You could get a tar get target effects pedals from here too now. That's bonkers. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it's a fantastic collection. So okay, so yeah, so that's the kind of stuff that you'll get at the at the at the Web Comics Lab as well as access to that kind of stuff. And then uh, part of that is that the library is going to be revamping comics.aadl.org with a web comics page. So you, your comics can be published on the library's website when you, the comics you create at the lab. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, more information. If, if you want more information on that, show up to the Web Comics Lab September 17th, 6 to 8 p.m. at Mallows Creek in Ann Arbor, Michigan. What else is Let's going see, on? There's a lot of cool events. I don't know if we have time to highlight all of them. But no. if you're interested in creating comics, you might also be interested in the Emerging, in the emerging Writers series that they have. Let's see. The next one is Thursday, September 18th from 7 to 8.45 p.m. And... Which location is that? Traverwood. That's at the Traverwood branch. So this is an ongoing workshop for writers, and it's for teens through adults, so grade six through adults. And it's a meet -up, again, a meetup, and it welcomes writers to connect. And there will be some authors there, it's Laura Zeeland and Margaret Yang, and they're there to help answer questions and to guide you through the process of writing. Oh, that's awesome. So, yes. So, now, so there's writers, there's uh, regular writers groups, and there's regular web comics groups at the library now. Um, so great, because like a lot of, like writing and making art is often a very solitary affair, and you get, you get into that cycle where like the first third of it, you're like, oh, I, don't know, I don't know if this is any good. This is no good, and I'm no good. And you have nobody to get feedback on. You can go to the internet, and you can get a whole bunch of strangers to, to react to it, or you can go to like an event like these and get local creators who you can get face-to-face -face interaction with and get some feedback and support on the things that you create, right? So kudos to the Ann Arbor District Library for making that happen. Yeah, some fantastic programs coming up. And go to ADL.org to look through the events. There's a lot more that we don't have time to highlight, but there's yeah. some really fantastic stuff coming up. Yeah, we do have to wrap this up. So, uh, and then as far as uh, my events, uh, I'm going to be doing a bunch of signings for the release of the Warren Commission report. And you can go to uh, 
comicsaregreat.com slash WR events to get the whole list. But I'm going to be signing all over Southeast Michigan at Green Brain Comics, at Schuler's Books, at Nicola's Books, Vault of Midnight. And then I'm going to be doing some uh, events in Brooklyn, New York uh, at Bergen Street Comics. And we'll be at uh, the New York Comic Con October 10th through 13th doing some events there for in, re in relation to the book. So come see me and buy the book and I will sign it. And if you cosplay as Lyndon B. Johnson, I will do an extra fancy sketch for you. Uh, okay, well, thank you, Anne, for the book thank recommendation. You. Uh, thanks to Rachel Ashley Lovelace, uh, Love Lovelace on uh, Instagram and Facebook uh, for the great conversation today. Thanks to Matt Dubay and Eric Kloster in the control room for keeping track of the links, doing all the switching and all making all the technological magic happen on this show. Thank you for downloading, watching, and listening. This show will be archived at comicsaregreat.com slash CAG102. And we'll be back in a couple weeks. We're going to be talking about Band Books Week. And that, that should be an exciting one. And until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.